there and welcome to another edition of Showreel 87, the BBC TV and Radio Times Awards for amateur film and video makers. This is the last programme in which I'll be showing some of the more unusual and more interesting entries in the competition. Tomorrow we'll be learning who the winners will be. The prizes, well, there's a first prize of £2,000 and a second prize of £1,000 and that's in each of the three age groups, 11 to 15, 16 to 24 and 25 plus. As usual, one of our five judges has joined me in the studio. Today it's the turn of film director Michael Apted and we'll be talking about some of the entries a little later on. Let's make a start with this film clip from 30-year-old film student Halfbane Vetra. He first became interested in film at Art College 14 years ago, but he was only able to pursue his interests fairly recently when he went to study at the London International Film School. His entry was shot on 35mm film. It's set in the early 60s and is about a landlady whose suspicions are aroused by her new male lodger, Night Stalker. Bye. Goodbye. This was approximately five foot ten inches tall and of medium build. Night Stalker by Halfbane Vetro. One of the most ambitious entries we received was a 40-minute drama with a large cast, a multitude of writers and a full amateur video crew, practically all of whom at the time were unemployed. 
The director was 27-year-old Elle Glenoa from London, and her entry is about a young woman discovering her own individuality. Fallout was shot on pneumatic. Sherry? It's OK? Hello. Long time no see. You're still in training, are you? Why? Do you want to feel my biceps? I don't know why you bother. That ain't what your mate says. What, Sharon? They made me laugh. She's got taste. Ain't that just what I said? Hey, okay. Kate. What's this idea about you and this college geezer in there? Oh, you've been building up your ears too, have you? Oh, come on, you can tell your old mate, Jimmy Neighbour. What is all this? Give me a bit of peace. Oh, I say, Madam wants to read. What's that book anyway? Got any dirty bits, has it? Look, why don't you take your tongue for a walk? Oh, yes. You want to watch it, girl? You're fast running out of friends. What's so interesting about that book, anyway? The Memoirs of a Survivor by Doris Less. Doris Less. <laughs> What's she survived that, eh? Canteen? Food? No, actually, it was a nuclear war. Oh, nuclear war? Oh, yeah. The bomb, yeah. She's got to be Russian in there, she is. Can't you take anything seriously? Not unless she's wearing a skirt, no. You may be sick. Well, what have I said now? What? Look, um, about what happened in the canteen, I want to say I'm sorry. Good, you're sorry. Now, let me get on. It wasn't all my fault, you know. I don't know why you hang around with Jimmy, neighbour. He stinks. Why don't you take everything so seriously? I mean, I know Jim went a bit over the top, but it just seems... Yeah? Well, it just seems so we can't have a bit of fun without you biting our heads off. What are you trying to tell me? Look, there's nothing that doesn't go on here that doesn't happen in every factory. Look, I don't care what happens in Outer Mongolia. I don't see why I should have to find it funny. Look, I don't see why you should have to heap all the blame on me. I mean, there's others worse. OK, Harry, you're not the worst. But it doesn't help when you sit there and say nothing. If you feel any differently, you should speak up, because I'm certainly not going to do it for you. But they're my mates. I'd look stupid if I took your side. Well, that's your problem, isn't it? Fallout by El Glenoa. Well, with me today is Michael Apted, who has had a distinguished career in both television and feature films. He directed and produced such notable documentaries as Seven Up and 28 Up, and his feature films have included Stardust, Coal Miner's Daughter and Gorky Park. He's currently working on his new film, Gorillas in the Mist. Well, welcome, Michael. It's lovely to have you along. Thank you. What did you think of those two entries? Well, Night Stalker first. I think it's an interesting idea to do a period piece, and there was a nice sense of the period in the costumes, the hair, the locations, and it was even sort of photographed in the style. But I thought the idea was a little bit stale, and he didn't do himself any favours by the music, which also seemed very antiquated. And if he'd taken a leaf out of, say, Chariots of Fire, where contemporary music was brought to bear on a period film, it somehow seemed to bring the movie to life, whereas I thought that music sort of slightly dragged it down. The other one was, I think, more appealing and more ambitious, because it's a group of people really trying to deal with problems of the society they live in. Fallout. Fallout, yes. And I admired it for that. I mean, it was dealing with problems of race and sexism, whatever. But it sort of lost its way a bit. There was some very good acting in it. I think the girl who played Kate was excellent, and all of them did very well. But when you're doing a complicated story like that, somehow I felt it lost its way. There was no sense of an overview of it. You know, a scene was played, and sometimes a scene went on too long and rambled away, and then you weren't quite sure where you cut to to the next scene. And I think one of the most difficult jobs in being a director is to keep the whole film in your head while you're directing the scene in front of you. Because actors are concerned mainly with what they're doing at that moment, and they can lose perspective. And if you improvise, which I suspect some of them did, which is very good to do, the director's got to keep kind of an eye on it, reins on it, because he's got to know the scene that follows on, whether what's happening here, which may be lively and interesting and new, is going to help him in the next scene. And I felt 
the trouble with fallout was it suffered a bit from being rambling and there wasn't a kind of strong control from the centre, which has to be the director. Right, thank you, Michael. Well, our next entrant learnt how to make videos from her father, a vicar who'd recognised the benefits of video for helping his parishioners. 17-year-old Fiona Adam of Preston decided her first video should be about a subject close to her heart, her mother. She Collects Junk was shot on VHS. <laughs> Memorabilia, memorabilia, that's the posh thing for the old stuff you throw out. Memorabilia, memorabilia, it can have a brand new lease of life and how. Old dresses, cartons, tins, all of those sportish things that have languished in your attic now for years. She'll take them off your hands, they'll look good on her stand in her little memorabilia hall. This might seem like junk to you and me, but to Mrs. Wendy Adam, it can represent a rare treasure of memorabilia. I asked Wendy how she first started collecting junk. Sorry, memorabilia. Well, the first thing I started uh, collecting with was this Oxford in here, which I found in an antique shop. I've always been interested in old things like that, and... Um, I thought it would be nice to develop it in some way and to use it for some good. And I thought, well, perhaps I could use it for raising charity funds somehow. <clears throat> so I, I collected more things and got quite a large collection. And then I had exhibitions in the church hall at Christ Church at Thornton, where we were before. And we raised £1,200 for cancer research and kidney research. And then we moved to Scorton, which is um, quite a beautiful little tourist attraction. A lot of people come here, and I thought it would be nice somehow to open a permanent exhibition. And as the vicarage is quite large, um, there are very big cellars downstairs, which really um, were ideal and lent themselves to a good exhibition. With all the different things you've collected, at some point you must have been tight for storage space. Obviously, a lot of it is down in the, in the exhibition in the cellars at the moment, um, but there are, there's a surplus of goods that has to be repaired, or if I want to change the exhibition over. Is there a charge for coming in? Uh, not a charge, uh, a donation, a minimum donation, but if people want to give more, we don't mind. And then they go and they look around, and it's very interesting to hear them say, oh, I remember this, or... That there reminds me of my granny's store cupboard and, you know, when there were children, I remember. And I also do a mannequin parade. I collect old clothes, wedding dresses, um, ordinary dresses, hats, shoes. And I have um, a set of girls and we do mannequin parades for the same reason, to raise money for charity. She Collects Junk by Fiona Adam. Now, we all appreciate the work of nurses and we all know how badly paid they are. It was this contradiction that set Emma Whitlock off to question how the different perceptions of nurses affect them in their work. Emma, a film student, called her documentary, shot on pneumatic, Images of Nurses. I think a lot of doctors, for example, think I have got quite a low opinion of nurses. And it just encourages them, you know, they see this ridiculous uniform with someone sort of in it. <laughs> and how can they respect that person? And they don't. And it just reinforces the sort of stereotypes that are already there. Because when you're thinking about, or talking about nurses' uniform, uh, everybody wants to have a go, because uniform is one of the subjects that really gets um, uh, quite important to people. I personally like the rather traditional nurses' uniform, and I think you'll find that the nurses who wear that traditional uniform, and you find it in many hospitals, wouldn't change it at all. I think that the lovely frilly cap that you will see in some of the portraits is still the kind of thing that nurses you know, would like to wear. Tonight? Um, one at 11 and one at 4. Are you going to come back here or...? 
I'll come back at the 11 one, but I'm not going to come back at 4. There are incredibly stringent regulations on most wards as to uniform and precisely how much makeup you can wear and which jewellery you can wear and which isn't very much. Yeah, wedding rings can be worn, can't they? I think you you put on your uniform and then you're armed with all your props and it's just as if you're going on stage and saying you're and you also you do say your lines. It's as if you've got a script, isn't it? There are certain set like difficult situations. There's always a set response yes. like what a shame or <laughs> and it becomes quite hard sometimes to speak out of line when you're wearing your uniform, doesn't mm. it? I think it's maybe it's some kind of solace for being so low down at you know, at least you've got a pretty uniform. Good morning. Good morning. Please sit down. You look very nice in your uniform. It's like putting on a costume, though, putting on a uniform. It's like going out on stage and acting. I mean, you, you can have some of those feelings and you're getting ready. You think, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm going to work, and yet I feel like I'm just about to perform in some musical or something. <laughs> Michael? How are you doing your mouth washing? What does it taste like? A lot of people really sort of like this traditional image of nurses with, with frilly hats and aprons and black stockings and all that sort of carry on. I can't remember who it was, but some major medical figure it was about a year ago suggested that nurses, only on male wards, that nurses should wear shorter uniforms and black stockings, and I think it was high heels as well. But it was, and that they would then get better quicker, they would perk out really quite fast. Mm. I think that's a terrible thing to say, really. Because, as I said, nurses are there to earn a living and to care for people. They're not really there as sex symbols to make patients get better. I think if you have patients like that, then they might need to be in a psychiatric unit rather than in the general ward. Mm, so do I. Images of Nurses by Emma Whitlock. So, Michael, what did you think of those last two? Well, I thought they were pretty good. I mean, nurses I liked because it used different materials. It used film clips, stills, and it's funny. I mean, whoever made the film got them to be quite funny. The other one was nice, a bit one-dimensional. But I mean, I'm interested in all this because I started in documentaries. That's how I got going. And I think it's a very good way to start because you know, you're not burdened with a script and it's very difficult to find good writing or a script as I've seen looking at all the entries and I find in my professional life as well. So you can get out there, find good characters and learn about characters and learn how to handle characters in documentary. And I think the other good thing about documentary, it teaches you to think on your feet which is a lesson you'll never, ever regret. Whether you're doing a huge million dollar budget film or whatever, things never go as you expect them to. And in documentaries, you have to make things up as you go along. And I think it's a good lesson to learn. So I was sort of surprised that more documentaries didn't come in because it's an excellent way to cut your teeth. OK, thanks very much, Michael. Right, many schools use video to encourage children to express their ideas on matters of concern. Usually they're a mixture of ad-lib role-play and more controlled scripting. And our next entry is one of the more successful examples of this kind of classwork. Stand By Me was made by pupils at the Stoke Newington School in North London and was shot on pneumatic at the Inner London Education Authority's Media Centre. It's hard work. God, my back aches. I feel great. <laughs> Couldn't help noticing, though, when the instructor t told us to imagine we were punching or kicking someone. I mean, you really got into it. I just couldn't do it. Look, it's just practice. It goes against everything you've learned at first. You know, like, um, girls ain't supposed to be able to fight and all that shit. I just imagine it's someone I really dislike, and I'm kicking hell out of them. <laughs> then you start to enjoy it. Listen, do you want me to massage a bet for you? Mm. Just, just there. Oh, that's good, yeah. These exercises will make you feel stronger, you'll see. I mean, I feel that already. It's just, I ain't used to moving my body in that kind of way. That 
she was better, thanks. So why did you come at self-defence classes then? Well, for kicks. <laughs> no, not really. We started getting these phone calls, you know, picking up the phone and nobody answering it. Really? Yeah. I mean, I started saying to them, like, what do you want and who are you? But nobody answers. I mean, we get them four or five times a night, three or four o'clock in the morning. You told the police about that then? My mum says it ain't worth it. That's true, you know. It's not just the phone calls. I feel like I'm being watched, followed. It's horrible. I start to get scared. Then I see these self-defence classes, so I came, just in case. That's very wise, though. I thought so, but, well, I mean, I ain't so sure about it. It's what? Well, I mean, that what we've just been doing. What's wrong with it, though? Well, nothing, but, I mean... But what? But, I mean, will I be able to do it if it really happens? Will I be able to knock somebody off balance, trip them up? I mean, I'll be too scared, I'll just freeze. That's stupid, you have to protect yourself. Yeah, but I mean, will I? I mean, it takes me a few se But it takes me a few seconds of getting organised. I mean, if I'm walking down the street and someone, someone just grabs me, it's going to take me too long to get myself organised. I ain't going to be able to do it. That's right, but you better get as good as you can, because if you are really being followed and someone knows where you live as well as your phone number and they go for you, you'll have to get your mind organised pretty damn quick. Thanks. <laughs> Stand By Me by Stoke Newington School. The Lost Youth Theatre, L-O-S-T, took its name from the London Oratory School Theatre and their first stage production ten years ago was West Side Story. The group is open to any child under 16 in the Fulham area and last year they finally turned their attention to making a video. The members of the group who made Why were all about 13 years old and their entry was shot on pneumatic. Favourite wimp, Martin. And his friend. Off to play football, are we? What are you doing with this? It's nothing. It's just a bit of plastic. Oh dear, forgot. Martin's daddy can't afford to pay for anything decent. Hey lads. Just give us the ball back, Will. You want the ball back? Here you go. Let me give you some advice. You see, two balls like this are only made of plastics. And they can't take much punishment. So if you keep knocking them and banging them around, they could burst. So I mean, if I went to like, like this, a couple more times, it might burst. Like this. Oh dear! It's burst! from you tomorrow morning, outside the school gates, and I don't want to be late for my lesson. Right? How much? <laughs> Look at me. When? Tomorrow. Where? School. Right. Get him out of here. Get out of here. You know what? I almost feel sorry for him. <laughs> Think he's going to play out? He's well scared. What the other kids do?
I'm never gonna paint. I'm never gonna paint. Oh, why by the Lost Youth Theatre? If you go to Coventry, you'll find an enterprising bunch of pupils at the Sydney Stringer School. They've performed a rock musical in China, of all places, and last year the same production won an award for school's drama. Having conquered one medium, they've now turned their attention to another, video. Eleven pupils with an average age of 15 have been spending their lunch times working on a love story with a high-tech look. The result, shot on Video 8, TV Love. Yes, I've been watching you. Oh, it's you. I've been looking all over for you. Well, I'm here now. I've said all about you. They say you do windows. For you, anything. Just say the word. But I'm not sure I should. Just this once. Trust me. Oh, just this once. You feel like sunshine tickling me. Now I find you. I won't be able to live without you. Summer breeze, a beautiful Hi, don't I know you? I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before. Yes, I've been watching you. Oh, it's you. I've been looking all over for you. Well, I'm here now. I've heard all about you. They say you do wonders. For you, anything. Just say the word. But I'm not sure I should. Just this once, trust me. Oh, just this once. You feel like sunshine tickling me. Now I've found you, I won't be able to live without you. Wait, don't go. Who are you? I want to go with you. But you can't. Please, there's nothing here for me. All I want is you. Are you sure? happy ending. <laughs> Michael, those last three entries were all on video, which is obviously much more accessible than mm. film, isn't it? Well, it's brilliant, I think, because it's disposable, it's cheaper, you can wipe stuff off you don't like, so you don't have to live with it. And I mean, I use it now. I mean, I'm sure feature film directors use it, whatever you're doing, because it's useful to cast with, you can try scenes out with it, you can find locations with it. So I think it's indispensable th throughout the whole industry, not just, you know, what we're looking at now.
Mm. How do you go about preparing a film? I mean, where do your priorities lie? Is it in the script or the casting or location? Well, I mean, I think the difficult thing, and it, it's something I share with everybody out there, is the choice of material. What do you do? You know, how do you find something? And what I always look for is, is a good story, but with a relationship in the middle of it. You know, a relationship between two people, with a man or a woman, or two men or whatever, or two women but at least something that you can tell the story through a relationship so you don't have people spouting ideas at the wall or whatever. And I always look for that. And then there's the casting other than the script. And I don't think with a script you ever stop writing the script until you finish editing. You're always changing it. You're changing it when you shoot it. You're changing it in the cutting room. And the cast, because I think casting is as important a job any director ever has to do. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of care because however good the script is, however clever you think you might be if the cast is wrong, you've had it. You know, you know up, up, up the river without a paddle in the canoe, as it were. And I think the most difficult thing for me and anybody going in for this competition is what do you do? What is the material that interests you? And what is the balance? What is the key to it? You know, what, what handle do you get? And as I said, I look for a relationship, whatever the film is, whether it's a thriller, a comedy, a musical, or whatever. It's always something going on between two people. Right. Thank you, Michael. It was a visit to the cinema 31 years ago to see the red balloon that enthralled Philip Marsham and inspired him to consider filmmaking. When he could finally afford a camera, he found that none of his friends would appear in his films, but he persevered. 39-year-old Philip, a Wiltshire train driver, is now an experienced amateur movie maker, although he says he still hasn't cracked the problem of recording good sound. Here's an extract from his entry, which was shot on Super 8mm film, Learning the Newspaper Business. I was beginning to wonder why Laverton needed a newspaper at all, but we didn't miss an issue. The Laverton Journal had been published every week since 1893, a tradition we were on our bound to keep. How we managed to fill each issue was a mystery, but then we had a crisis. What's well, up? There's nothing to put in the paper. Nothing happened all week. Nothing? Nothing. Well, we'll have to do something about it then, won't we? Has it happened before? Oh, yes, happened be just before you came. Your predecessor's disappearance uh, saved us then. What are we doing? Well, use your imagination, then. Be creative. Yeah. Come with me, then. Uh, Jim, remember your rope, lad? Yeah, of course. Do you want some hunting then, Tom? Yes, Jim. A good call, too. Red lad. He's red line. Jim Price murdered by person or persons unknown. Well, come on, lad. Get your notebook. Start taking some notes. This is our smashing story. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You go round and interview the family tonight. I'll write the editorial. Right? Hmm. <laughs> cool. Well, that's about it. Time to eat. Come on, lad. It was a good story, and Claire kept it going for several weeks. <laughs> Never forget, lad. Public must be served. Of course, sometimes you've got to improvise a bit, you know. Someday when you've got a paper of your own, I hope you'll remember and realise all I'm teaching you. Learning the Newspaper Business by Philip Marsham. I hope he doesn't give Fleet Street any ideas. Now, before I introduce our last entry for today, I'd like to thank Michael Apted for joining me, although he'll be back again tomorrow with all the judges to tell us who the winners will be. Now, with all the extracts we've shown in these programmes, we've tried to avoid making any edits to the material, but sometimes we've had to make minor cuts to reproduce the sense of the whole film. In our last entry today, though, we had to make more substantial cuts to reflect the maker's intention. So I hope that Francis O'Connor and Julian Mawson, who are both students at the Wimbledon School of Art and Design, will forgive us for showing a much shortened version of their entry. Until tomorrow, then, for the announcements of the prize winners, I leave you with Dream Lover, shot on 8mm film. Bye for now. Dream. Charms whenever I want you, all I have to do is.
his dream Dream, dream, dream When I feel blue In the night And I need you To hold me tight Whenever I want you All I have to do Is dream Every night I hope and pray A dream lover Will come my way a girl who hold in my arms I know the magic of her charms Cause I want a girl to call my own I want a dream lover So I don't have to dream alone Dream lover, where are you? With the love of all so true And the hand that I can hold Get your soul. 